We did pretty well, wouldn't you say? Ed, we survived. We survived, right? Thank you, Francis, and all those who are a few voices, and two voices, and Pharisees, and particularly to Nicole, and to Donna, and to Ben. You know, um, I want to say, first of all, it's kind of weird to be back here in this place. I, I had this sense that after being out of the pulpit for three weeks, that it was really going to be hard to grind up the wheels again. Um, and so I kept postponing. I was like, oh, I'll just keep waiting and waiting to write my sermon. So really, um, it was one of those things where it's like, Saturday has come. Now the time is near, right? <laughs> there can be no more waiting. But I want to say, you know, it, it, it's my hope. Becky asked this week if I would be preaching from the pulpit about my time in Palestine and Israel. Um, and one of the things that I said is, I hope that um, Stephen and I can actually have some set-aside time to not only share our pictures, not just about a travel log kind of thing, but to share about our time and the things that we witnesses and the things that we learn together with you. So I'll be working with folks here to find that time. Um, maybe we'll be inspired, I don't know, to make a falafel dinner, Stephen. What do you think? We, can, we could probably pull that off and feed everyone at the same time. So I want to just acknowledge that um, we will be looking for a time to be able to share that with everybody. And I want to say again um, how grateful I am that I was able to go with Stephen um, on this very special trip and that your prayers went with me and surrounded us as we were there. You know, in the book that our adult Sunday school class just finished studying, anybody know the name of it? The Heart of Christianity. Marcus Borg, uh, the author, makes the cakes and proposes that we need more ways to describe what's wrong with us and in the world, as well as why we're lost than a mere three-letter word, that word being sin, right, sin. We need more ways than just this word to catch everything. So he makes the case that through the Bible, we actually see different stories lifting up these different ways to describe what's wrong and why we're lost. So for example, the Hebrews in Egypt, that whole story illustrate that sometime what's wrong is not sin, but that we are enslaved and oppressed. And so salvation comes in the form of freedom and liberation. He talks about the biblical story of the Hebrews then being set free and then wandering in the desert for 40 long years and illustrates that at other times what's wrong and why we're lost is that we're actually lost. We don't know the way and that we are hungry and thirsty. And so salvation comes in the form of a way, of food, and of drink. And then, of course, through the Bible, we read of the prophets, Micah and Amos being great examples who talk endlessly about how what's wrong is that our hearts have become closed and hardened. And salvation comes in the form of healing and the opening of our hearts back up, not only to God, but to one another. In today's scripture, the wonderful and long story provides us with yet another way to consider what's wrong and why we're lost with us and in the world. Jesus, in encountering and healing the man born blind, challenges his disciples and the Pharisees and the crowd and even the parents to see that what's wrong with us sometimes is that we're blind. Let us pray. As we seek paths in the darkness, O oh God, open our eyes to your light. Amen. So I want to pause for a second. I know you have your Bibles out already because that's a habit that we have here at Chinese Community Church. We open our scripture during the sermon to the text that we're studying together. And that comes from not the Gospel of Luke, but rather John chapter 9. And what I want to do is follow Derek's good lead last week and ask you to just talk to their neighbors for a quick second here. And what you're going to do is talk about where and how 
you see blindness manifested in this story. Okay? So again, we had a fantastic rendering by Donna, Nicole, and Ben, as well as the whole team. And I'm going to ask you to just talk with your neighbors. You can get up. If you want to just be a pair, if you, are, if you know you're looking over at your husband or wife right now and you know I ain't going to talk to them, I see them every day and I don't feel like talking, I know, Jane, I'm horrified too. <laughs> or it's your sister or something like that. If you know that's a fact, then I, I invite you to get up off your haunches and go talk to somebody else. Okay? But you, maybe you can crunch up in the pews that you're in and, and uh, do that. But again, how and where do you see blindness manifested in this story? All right, go. more seconds, 30 more seconds. Thanks to those you talked to. And then let's join back together as one body. So can you just shout out some people that you saw blindness in? Just shout them out. Crowd. The crowd, crowd. And, and in the text in the NRSV, it was the, the crowd is known as the neighbors, actually, right? So I heard another one, Ursula. The Pharisees, okay, the Pharisees. Who else did you experience blindness blind in? in this? The, the actual <laughs> blind man, right? Aha, yes. <laughs> the, the most obvious, thank you. Anybody else? The parents. the parents, okay. And who else? Anybody else? So we have parents, Pharisees, the crowd. Steve? This is the reader of the scriptures. Ah, the reader. Oh, deep. I like it. That must have been from my husband. <laughs> or the guy named Steve. <laughs> yeah, from, from the re us, the readers. And the thing that I want to lift up and affirm about that is when you said that, Steve, what it reminds us is that we participate in the story, right? The story is not separate from us, but that we participate in making meaning and need sight to understand. Anybody else? The reader, the parents, the neighbor crowd, the Pharisees, the man himself. Anybody else? Well, so let's explore this, okay? I actually want to propose that the, if I just went through the stories as is, the blindness begins with the disciples. The disciples. When they encounter a man who is born blind and presumably sitting on the side of the road begging, right? Their first question is what? Who sinned? Who can we blame? His parents or him? They go into their heads, as it were, and ask a theoretical theological question and not wow gosh how how is it that this man came to be on the side of the road and what can we do 
right? They are blind to the man's humanity and to his pain and suffering, to his condition. And they're blind, I want to propose, to their connection to him. They ask about him as if he's an object. They are instead looking to blame and point fingers in the face of suffering. So let's pause a moment and ask, when have we, like the disciples, been blind? The second group that I want to pick up, right, is the crowd, the crowd. You guys did a great job. The crowd was great, right? Kind of, as we went along in the story, I could begin to hear the like, Rrr, kind of like, who's that? And that kind of force. In the face of a miracle, right, literally, of a person that was born blind and now can see, these neighbors start arguing with each other about whether it's the same guy that they knew that was sitting there all along, right? Presumably, in some translations, the neighbors are his relatives, so you would think that the neighbors have seen him since he's been, like, yay tall. So the fact that they're asking the question, wait, are you the same guy that we knew him up? Who, who are you? And then when they are told the quirky method of healing, right, the spit and the... Now, all of us, it's the new face mask that Jesus made up. They march him off to the Pharisees, presumably to have it explained or proven or disproven or maybe even condemned for what's happened. You know, they don't hug the guy. They don't say, wow, my gosh, you can see that's so great. I can't even believe this has happened to you. They don't celebrate with him. They don't throw a big party with a banner that says, congratulations, Yusuf can see. They don't begin to take him around and say, look at me, I've been your neighbor all along. Or, this is the place that we've been talking about and going to. No, they don't even believe him when they tell him, or they, he tells them what's happened. The neighbors, I propose, are blind to the miracle that happens in life and to the healing and to the joy of the moment. When, I wonder, have we, like the neighbors, been blind? Then there are the Pharisees, right? And I, I wish it weren't so, because the Pharisees are not bad guys. Right? But they always get labeled in this particular ga gospel as like, whenever you see the Pharisees, it's like, ding, 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 bad guy, bad guy, you know. And I, I wish it weren't so, but there they are. They were folks who unfortunately or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it, loved rules. Okay? That, that was their, in some sense, what we could say was a downfall. They loved making the rules and they loved following the rules, actually. And they didn't know quite what to do when things didn't fit within the rules. Like this guy with his healing. Not only did it happen on the Sabbath, okay, the holy day of rest, the big rule breaker, but it happened by a no-name, no-credentialed guy. And so they argue about the rules, right? Was a so-called healer of God or not? Right? He didn't follow the rule of the Sabbath, that's for sure, we know that. But then again, wow, how can, a, how can a sinful man do miracles? And when they couldn't get anywhere with that, they accused the guy of being a fake. Did you notice that line? They ask him, they, they, it says in the text, well, they decided, actually, they didn't believe that he was blind from the very beginning. Right? So that's why they have to haul in his parents to verify his condition. The Pharisees, I want to propose, are blind, in a sense, to everything beyond their rules and their comfort zone. They're blind to the messiness of life, to the way things often don't fit, and to how not fitting doesn't necessarily equal bad. They're blind to how God is bigger than any rules that we can possibly make, and they're blind to the beauty, the possibility, and even the holy that is in the gray areas. When, I wonder, have we, like the Pharisees, been blind? In 
And then, of course, we come to the parents, right? I wish I didn't have to talk badly about the parents. And I, I, I don't mean to in any way, right? Parents, we always know, do the very best they possibly can. And they're kind of caught in a difficult situation. Their son, on the one hand, is miraculously healed. And it's kind of weird because as you're reading the story, if, if this was your son and your son comes home and can see you, you kind of would assume like the neighbors or the crowd, they should have been joyful and grateful and goodness and be preparing like all of the, the falafel and the pita breads at home to invite everybody over because a miracle has happened. Instead, instead, unfortunately, in the midst of what should have been a joyful celebration, they're hauled in to, quote, defend their son. And they do so, we learn, at the risk of, if they give the wrong answer, of being kicked out of the community. So their answer is a bit hard to decipher, right? He says, he's a grown man. He can speak for himself, right? So I don't know if that's like trying to pass the buck, or that's like, wow, we want to give dignity to our son who is a grown man and who can speak for himself. Are they trying to help him or save their own tushies from trouble? If it's the latter, they opt for silence rather than standing up for the truth. And so they choose, in some sense, to be blind to the truth and to their relationship to the truth. They choose to be blind to the courage that it takes to stand up for the truth. And so I wonder, when have we, like the parents, been blind? And then great thanks to Wendy, of course, because the perceptiveness of the person who was born blind was also blind, right? <laughs> and so we, we realize at the beginning of the story, he literally, well, he cannot see. But in contrast to all of these folks, the disciples, the neighbors, the Pharisees, and the parents, the blind man comes to be able to see. Through Jesus' touch, he comes to see physically. Yes, but I propose that he also comes to see spiritually. He's able to see his healing for what it is, the work of God, a prophet, and his healer for what he is. The one who's come from God, one who speaks to us from God. And he sees Jesus when Jesus reaches out to him after he's been kicked out once again as the one worthy of worship. And perhaps just as importantly, the man born blind sees that he was blind. I want to say that again. More importantly, the man born blind sees that he was blind and rejoices in his new ability to see. Our invitation this Lenten season is to allow the one who calls himself the light of the world to break into our darkness, to reach out and touch our eyes be it with spit and dirt, be it with whatever mode God so chooses, and heal our blindness so that we may declare with that same man and all those who have come and experienced sight anew, just like the one who penned that wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace, I once was blind, but now I see. Amen. <laughs>